about uh, the first reading of Charles Bukowski that I attended in 1974. Uh, I think all of you were there, so I don't, you know, I see some new faces, but uh, I won't read that again. I, I could, second reading is going to be helpful, but I thought I'd read this one called North Beach just to sort of create a little atmosphere um, because I um, was around in the 70s as a young student, budding journalist, photographer, and those were very important times, you know, we were marching for the Vietnam War, uh, feminist movement. The world was open, you could do anything you wanted if you, you know, were ambitious and curious enough. And uh, with curiosity being my focus, not so much ambition, because I was also a student and married with two young kids running around. So. Uh, the point is, I wanted to do it all in terms of being a writer and learning stuff and being in the action. And, um, well, this was actually for, jumping a, a couple of years ahead, uh, I was doing a book about famous people and their refrigerators. I, I had been a rock and roll disc jockey in LA and San Diego, and one late, late morning, about two in the morning, I was subbing for someone doing a blues show, six hours of playing the blues, which is, well, give you the blues. And um, I got this idea, wow, you know, wouldn't it be fun to see what's inside people's refrigerators? We all have that in common, <laughs> the milk, the butter, uh, maybe the, the beer, uh, the salad. And I started this project, and it wound up, you know, being, uh, you know, I made a wish list of the people I wanted. And um, in those days, you could make phone calls and, and get, you know, like Steven Spielberg or, or uh, Ed Ruscha, um Martin Scorsese, all of these people were in, in the book, and, uh, and Bukowski, that's why you see the refrigerator picture, that was from a special shoot of, uh, you know, photographing his refrigerator, and all he had in it was grapefruit juice and vitamins, and I brought the Mexican beer, because I, you know, he liked that, and I like to spoil them, and not, I told him to get off the cheap stuff, so it's full of Mexican beer, uh, but anyway, this is just jumping ahead, being in San Francisco, and being there to photograph Lawrence Ferlinghetti, and, um, and Neely Chernovsky and Bill Graham, the concert promoter for Rolling Stones, and Imogene Cunningham, the great photographer that photographed her. She was in her 90s. So it's called North Beach 1976. It includes the usual suspects. The San Francisco poets have gathered deep in the bowels of city lights, just a stairwell away from passing tourists in search of a silicone monument to Carol Doda a cafe au lait at Enrico's, a stroll to Chinatown or the wharf. It's business as usual in North Beach, oblivious junkies, off-duty hookers, and just down from street level, the San Francisco poets regard each other in a congratulatory dance for no particular feat except survival. Their books are a backdrop to this right, subtly, spontaneously choreographed, well-worn hands dip into the guacamole slice a bit of cheddar, some apple. We drink wine from plastic cups, vintage Valley of the Moon, Ferlinghetti explains sheepishly, top hat and Merlin grin intact. This is ostensibly a party to launch John Ritchie's book, The Sexual Outlaw, and he holds forth in stripped down denim, body consciousness 100 proof. I smile tolerantly as people pass by and stare at my chest. They all recognize the apparition on my t-shirt. That old wolfman Bukowski, does he really get laid as much as they say? <laughs> Is he still writing the same shit? The Chinese clerk from upstairs is doing a one-way monologue on punk rock. Ferlinghetti wonders if one must be a punk to really dig it. We linger politely. I segue to his last book, Wrapped Attention on All Sides. Neely Cherry hawks his first book. Hey, can I sign it for you? It's only two bucks. Neely and Norse have put their gayness on the line, someone whispers. Ginsburg's holed up in a faraway corner, feeling obliged to carry on. Orlovsky, still in tow, ubiquitous like in the 60s, sporting the same suit, narrow tie, faded tennis, silver ponytail. Do I know of any heterosexual baths, he wonders? Tales of a nonstop orgy. Ginsburg heads up the stairs. Coming, Peter, he announces to the air, but Orlovsky obstinately extends his conversation. Kerouac was right. He knew when it was time to blow the joint. 
Ferlinghetti stuck around, but on his own terms. Coney Island was just a pit stop. He knows where the bones are buried. He's just not ready for the final dig. But weird names for him because he was so much, out of all the people I've photographed and interviewed over the years, he and Henry Miller became special for me in so many ways. Every way except being an intimate lover, which people always speculate. They say, oh, you were a young girl and these old guys, you know, why were you as a feminist hanging out with the dirty old men? Well, I wasn't a feminist, I was a humanist, and to me that was more important. I was marching around for women's lib, but I was just for humanism. And the point is, is these guys are fascinating. I was reading the Tropic books when I was 16 and wanted to hitchhike to Big Sur and seduce Henry Miller. And of course that didn't happen, and thank goodness it didn't. But, um, you know, fast forwarding to being mid-20s, um, my dream was to interview Henry Miller, which I wound up doing for Penthouse, and, and it was thrilling, and, and there was a, a wonderful friendship, mentorship that developed. And ironically, he and Bukowski always wanted to meet each other. And but, but Hank would slyly ask me, well, what about Miller? What are you doing, hanging out there all the time, having dinner? And, and Henry would say, well, what about Bukowski? Can he come out here for dinner sometime? And I said, well, we'll see. And I would make these little overtures, and there was just too much, I think, testosterone and, and the question of timing, and I don't know why we never got them together, but at any rate, it would have been a nice evening, I think. I think Henry was too frail by then to, Mr. Bukowski wouldn't punch him or do anything <laughs> too challenging. I think it would be a respectful alliance, but you don't know. It's always unpredictable. This is the first event, by the way, it's not over yet, but every exhibition I've ever had with London or Helsinki, uh, there's always somebody that thinks he's Bukowski and steals the booze <laughs> and it starts a fight. And this is a nice exception that hasn't happened yet. And, and it should be yes. for a <laughs> civilized company. But okay. <laughs> Uh, I, I am a free-form, spontaneous, jazzy kind of person, so I'm not doing an academic, straightforward, chronological thing, but let's cut to the chase. That's why we're here. Um, right. I, I was you know, in L.A., in Hollywood, and uh, always seeking out people that I wanted to learn from, that I was curious about, that I thought other people would like to read about. And uh, Mr. Bukowski wasn't on that list. Way. But uh, okay, I was reading. I, I studied also poetry at LA City College. I didn't know he had gone there at the time, but my teacher was Sam Eisenstein, and and Sam invited Liza Minnelli, who I got to know pretty well because we were both writing for the Free Press, and I didn't know Liza was a, uh, a close uh, friend of, of Charles Bukowski. But anyway, she was quite the character. And uh, that whole scene at LA City College was very, very important. I took that course three times. It was just so special. And uh, I mean, to really age myself, and I don't care at this stage of life, I was always the youngest in the room lying about my age, so at this point, straight ahead. But I was, you know, we were at school the day Kennedy was assassinated. And I remember arriving and hearing this buzz on the campus. And all of a sudden, the Black Panthers, who I used to kind of know some of them, and they started cheering. And I, I thought, going on, and it was a really interesting juxtaposition of emotions and walking into my sociology class and saying, John F. Kennedy's just been in shock, you know, like in shock, and then the professor saying, ah, sit down, what are you talking about, you know, we don't have time for jokes, but that whole atmosphere, you know, colored, colored things for our generation. Anyway, um, I got a phone call from a good friend of mine, Glenn Esterly, one day. Glenn and I worked well, I worked freelance writing for a public television station, and Glenn worked there. Glenn was an aspiring journalist, and really, we all wanted to get into Rolling Stone. That was like the pinnacle. And uh, not, we didn't need to cover of Rolling Stone, but we wanted to get into Rolling Stone. And Glenn called me and said, hey, I, I got an assignment for Rolling Stone. And I said, fantastic, tell me about it. And he said, well, I want you to do the pictures. I said, yeah, okay, well, tell me about it. He says, oh, is this guy Charles Bukowski? I said, no. No, 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 I don't want anything to do with the dirty old man, thank you. I read his stuff in the free press and it's, you know, I find it offensive and condescending to women, misogynistic, la la la. He said, stop, I hear you. Come with me Friday night to the reading at Cal State LA. And that was the college I was going to at the time. And so I thought, and I, I didn't know about it. So uh, we went and um, yeah, 
it, you know, a Bukowski reading, and you, many of you, I'm sure, probably all of you have seen videos or whatever of his readings, and, and it's like the energy in the room is just heavy, and he's, it's like a, a bullfight. Um, but, and he's the matador, but he's always gonna win, if that makes sense. But um, anyway, I met him after the reading, and took two pictures. You know, my mother always told me, don't waste film. And the film you know, wasn't so expensive as it is now, but um, I took two pictures. And they have to be good when you're, you know, you've got two shots. And a week later, Glenn and I were going to go to his house and um, he'd do the interview, and I would photograph him. And my mother taught me when you steal a photo, when you steal someone's image, you have to give it back. So I made it some prints of this, and I put them in a little box. And I got there before Glenn, and I gave him the box. And you know, we went in the house, and he opened it up, and he was sitting on his couch, and he was very quiet, and he looked at them. And tears started going down his face, and he said, you know, I'm not going to try to imitate it. It's too early in the morning, and I don't do it well. <laughs> but, um, he said, you know, they always come here, they steal my wine, no, they steal my women, they steal my booze, they s smoke my cigarettes, and they leave. Nobody ever gives me anything. And he closed the box, and by then, this emotional moment, then Glenn arrived. But the point is, there was this interesting bond. And after that meeting, he contacted Carl Weisner, who was his friend, translator, agent in Germany, and said, Joan has to be my photographer. Uh, and they were just about to launch his book tour in Germany for this Kaput in Hollywood book. It turns out every German person I've ever met has that in their bookcase. Do you have it too, the, the blue book with the etching of his face? Yeah. It, at the bookmark, I was so impressed about the ribbon in the oh. So uh, that was evidently a huge sensation, and then when he and Linda toured with Michael Montfort, I moved away. People always wonder, how did you change places with Michael? Well, it was just a, like a dance thing. I, I left LA because we had to go to another city in California for my husband's work, and I couldn't always just run up and down, and Michael eased in the scene. I used to hang out with Michael a little bit in Hollywood, and uh, he was a colorful character. We had an exhibition in London in 1999 that Linda also gave her blessing to, and it was in a gallery in Soho uh, called Elmas Lester. And I always try to have my exhibitions not in shishi, uh, you know, posh galleries with white walls. It should be in more funky places that Hank would like to hang out in, like good bookstores or, and this was a design studio making all the, um, the sets for the Royal Opera House. So it was pretty cool, this theatrical environment, to have his, his work there. And um, there were, it was crazy. There were 2,000 people lined up down the street for the opening. I mean, it's crazy. It this whole, from 18 years old to like 80. And um, each time, and the BBC was interviewing me and, and taking, I mean, it was thrilling to see how serious they took him. And, um, Michael and I were doing interviews for Tokyo Television in Berlin and blah, blah, blah. I said, you know, this is, um, what would Hank do if he was here? And I just remember, I've never done anything like this in my life, but I just sort of unzipped my dress and dropped it. And Michael pulled his trousers down. And I knew I was okay because I was wearing red lingerie that could have been a bathing suit. But uh, we just let them have fun and we kind of horsed around because Michael couldn't do much with his trousers down to his ankles. But it was a Bukowski moment. I just share that with you because he brings out the, so much in all of us. I'm sure all of you have moments when you first discovered Bukowski. So anyway, that's my backstory, And the rest is history in this small little piece of the, the pie in the sense that um, that day that I um, met him with Glenn Esterly is when these photographs were taken. And uh, it, with the exception of the barbell one, that was a couple of years later for the refrigerator project. But, and in fact, just to give you some backstory too, but I know there'll be Q and A later and I don't want to over talk this. At that session, and I was there with a fellow that was working with me called Elvis Alberts, 
we were there and we knew we were going to photograph Hank and there was this frantic knocking at the door in the middle of our session and Hank opened it and this woman was standing while well, she's displayed the Hank and Georgia photos which I don't, no one's ever seen. There's a whole little cinematic series here of that session excluding the one famous one because you all know that one. Anyway, this woman was at the door in this very strange, chaotic state. And I thought, oh god, this is going to be trouble. But Hank invited her in, and he, he always had this sheepish kind of expression. And her skirt was way up in the back, and her stockings were hanging, and you could see her whole backside. And, you know, he, he, she says, God damn it, I don't know what's wrong. I was walking up Western and she says, I used to get cat calls, but even the cops were yelling at me today. And she says, I looked in the storefront and my whole ass was hanging out. And he says, yeah, yeah, baby, because your skirt's on backwards. And he, he starts adjusting her skirt and pushing it up very gentlemanly, very courtly. That was my, luckily I knew that part of him. I didn't know the angry, tough guy. Uh, that could be so cruel to, to people in like a second, the, the personality could change. So he uh, straightened, he looked at me while he's straightening her skirt. He says to me, you know, I'm always helping ladies out of their skirts. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, so uh, it was perfect. And then she got all set up. And then she said, so what's going on? And I thought, do we send her out? And I said, I somehow think we should let her stay. I don't know what's going to happen. but." It turned out to be a spontaneous, crazy session. And I wound up having contact with her for the next six months or so. Unfortunately, she died a year later. She had two young daughters. And um, I'm sorry, I get very emotional. That's why I get angry when that picture gets exploited, because after both of them were dead, so many people have tried to steal this image and des desecrate it and even say I didn't take the picture. And uh, it, it's painful because she was a woman that had her own story. She was a prostitute. She was a junkie. Uh, sometimes people said to me, wow, oh, you look so different in that picture. I was like, what? <laughs> so I said, yeah, and I stopped. I kicked my hair, what happened? So I kind of changed. But I don't think there's a resemblance, but I, I don't <coughs> mind because she, even in her troubles, she was a woman that, she was like, you know, she had two kids and she told me <clears throat> when I was photographing her because I shot a whole film all of her. She was crying and I said, what's going on? And then she was angry and she was frothing, literally like a, a dog with rabies. Her mouth was like almost foaming. And she said, there's a teacher at my daughter's school that's been fooling around with her and they won't take me seriously and that nothing's happening. And I just remember getting all puffed up and finding out more information and going to the school, talking to some mothers and finding what's what and getting you know, to the principal and trying to help her and get that checked out because she didn't have, she was like, like Bukowski writes about, the disenfranchised, the people that don't have anybody standing in their corner. Uh, I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back, I'm just saying there's a backstory, so it pisses me off when people say, oh, that ugly whore or is she a transvestite or whatever, the woman had a backstory, you know, everybody has a backstory. Um, so anyway, that's Hank and Georgia and uh, this session, these colored shots have never been seen before. I've discovered them, well, I know they existed, but I put them away many years ago. Because I thought, well, I only shot black and white, and I just thought they're, they're just warm-up photos. They're too kind of um, frivolous. It looks like your favorite uncle, and you know, anybody can have a nice picture of his favorite uncle. And is it Bukowski? And I was also, um, in these sessions, well, yeah, these, the portraits in black and white are part of a series I, I call Man Behind the Myth because they're not showing the cliché of Bukowski with the beer in his hand and the, the babe and the sly grin. Uh, they're after the session when nobody was around and he was talking to me and I never, I wasn't, I didn't have my first beer until I was 25 and I think around then I was 27. So um, I had a beer with him afterwards, which I normally didn't do, and he came up with this big plastic bag and it was full of marijuana. And he said, will you roll me a joint? I said, I, and it wasn't my thing, <laughs> but I kind of sell people doing it. So I said, well, you don't roll your own? He said, oh, I always get it wrong. I don't want to waste the stuff. And so I'm there kind of <laughs> rolling in this thing and I kind of got it together. But <clears throat> I just remember uh, that 
when he just started talking to me. And, and he was sitting uh, on his, he left the living room and went into his bedroom to get his stuff. And the sun was just beating him. And I'm an available light photographer. So I, I and he starts talking and really pouring his heart out about some stuff and getting these unposed expressions. I said, Hank, can I keep shooting? And I'm not going to say, Hank, could you sit over on this chair? Because the light's so much better. So these were lucky of just shots catching him in the moment. The chair, uh, let's see, was the chair? Oh, yeah, the chair on this number two image, he called it his throne. And uh, he was painting the walls. You know, he'd get distracted. So he was painting the walls of his house one day, and he stopped. Then he painted the chair one day. So there's stripes on the chair and the stripes on the wall. And he's just in his throne. He was happiest in that particular chair. Um, let me just see what I wanted to add to that other thing, because I, I think in this day of oversharing, there's so many things that I prefer to leave him in his privacy. But um, that was, uh, oh, oh, let me just think of, uh, oh, I know. Uh, a week or two later, I came back to photograph him again. And um, I was early, and I heard him. And I thought, OK. And then I was waiting. And then I thought, well, I'll just let him know I'm here. So I just said, hey, Hank, I'm here, and I'm waiting outside. Take your time, it's, you know, whatever. You're ready. And he says, nah, come on in. I'll be through in a few minutes. So I came in. And, he, and I knew he never wanted anybody to photograph him at work. And he had his glasses on, and his cigarette smoke was rising. Bruckner was on the radio, or Mahler, I don't know the difference. I, I <laughs> like my classical music, but those two are always complex. And um, it was a very relaxed atmosphere. And, I, and I'm not somebody, I'm not a paparazzi person. I'm not someone that will go on the street and take secret photos. I, I can't do it. I, my mother joked about stealing images, but I, I also respect people's privacy. So I said to him, hey, Hank, could I take a couple of shots of you typing? He says, yeah, go ahead. And he called me kid. He says, yeah, kid, go ahead. And so I took these shots and let's see. It's, no, the, uh, it's on the poster. Yes, yeah. right. So there he is at work. Just two shots again, no waste film. And uh, that I'm really honored because you see, it's no posing. He's there, deep in thought, fixing something. In the letters he sent me, it was always funny. And maybe, you know, the letters, there's always all these marks and crossing out things. and. He would make jokes about, uh, well, just different kinds of jokes. Um, people always said, well, how, how did he treat you, this dirty old man? I said, no, he was always a gentleman. He, he was Bukowski, so the first time you know, meeting him at his house, you know, he did the whole charm offensive and the flirting and all that, and I kind of disliked with anybody. He made clear, hey, Hank, I'm here to get, do my work. You've got to get back to your work. Let's go. And then he was interested more in my family background, how are the kids, and this and that. And he kind of, he would say things like, nice shoes. Are you going to wear those high heels again next time? You know, or, or uh, you know, hey, I like your hair today. Don't cut it. You know, it just, so he, he was, there's a reason he's born August 16th. Uh, he's a lion in heart and soul. But do you know the film The Wizard of Oz? Mm -hmm. The Wizard of Oz, the, the lion, uh, what's he called? The, you know, the lion, he's a scary lion, he's always afraid. Bukowski wasn't afraid, you know, well, you didn't see that anyway, but Bukowski was so much that lion from The Wizard of Oz, uh, in the sense of being the tortured, wounded beast. But on the outside, of course, and for the world, and, and, and it was this, the beautiful soul that you see on the printed page. And I'm not here trying to analyze him or anything. I think that the work stands for itself. But I just think that lion in him is what I understood and what I appreciate. I have a lion in me, so I wasn't afraid of him. I was the first time. I just thought, oh, God, you know, am I safe here? And is it this? And what's he like? And is he going to yell at me like he does at people? And, you know, if, if he, he, he hated, uh, yeah, he hated mediocrity, he hated phonies, and he would just, there were so many guys coming to knock on his door, always guys would-be poets wanting to be him and drink with him, and just shit writers and hoping a little Bukowski would rub off on them. And we just, that was another reason of moving to San Pedro to get out of that thing. But anyway, the photos should speak for themselves. I have nothing more to say except that it was an honor to have uh, been able to say yes and change my mind and not be stubborn, because it was a, um, 
again, he's been there so many times for me spiritually. I hear him, and when I get offers for exhibition, sometimes I'll say no. What would Hank say? You know, and it always has to be like in a bookstore or a really special place. Um, and also, Larry Flint of Hustler Magazine offered me three or five thousand dollars. I forget back in '76 for a Bukowski series of photos. And I'm not trying to, again, to sound like some saint. And money with the men's magazines was big stuff then. That's why Henry Miller told me, put it in penthouse. And I bought an electric typewriter with that payment I got. And I loved that typewriter so much. But anyway, with, with Larry Flint, I wrote the Mac said, no, thank you. Photos aren't available. Because I didn't think, that was ironic, finding out that he was in Hustler because I was trying to like protect him. I don't care, I don't regret that, but just, you know, and, but I'm glad I took their advice. Penthouse also asked me to be the first centerfold woman photographer. And I said, listen, if I accept this job, every woman is gonna be dressed in there, but they'll look, they, you know, they'll look sexy or whatever. And they, of course, they didn't want that. And I really didn't want it either, so I figured, let me say something that will absolutely end the discussion. So. That's it. C'est tout. And uh, thank you for listening.